This is Joe with Joe'sAstrophoto.com, and today we're going to cover some seldom used features in Nina. Today I wanted to go over some features that are seldom used, I almost never see in YouTube videos, and I think that they're important to cover, they can be useful, and one of them I just learned from one of my viewers just on one of my last videos. So the first seldom used function I want to show in Nina is one that I learned about in my last video or the video before that where I had done a two-night project and I actually lost the coordinates and so I took the fit file, opened it up in PixInsight and I had to convert the degrees into the correct coordinates and somebody had mentioned in the comments that, hey, you know, Nina could do this, just load up the file and it'll play solve. And, and I had no idea it would do that. So, but here it is. Um, you go into image source, you select file, you choose load image, um, you find a, a file from one of your subs that you want to plate solve on. Um, we're going to pick this one from uh, the Rosette Nebula that I did. And it'll go ahead and load it up into the screen. It's going to ask to plate solve and it'll actually do a plate solve. Here we go. We'll say yes. Um, it'll go ahead and plate solve based on the picture and give me, the, should give me the exact coordinates in here, populate them for me. This does take a second. Also, it'll show me how it frames up on this side when it loads in, which is very nice. So here it is loaded in. It gave me the coordinates that I needed. Um, it's also going to be able to allow me to slew the target, add it as a sequence, and I'll be able to add more data to this in the future if I want to. Uh, just that simple. The second feature that I see seldom used in uh, YouTube videos as well as I seldom use it is the um, mosaic ability inside of the framing tab. So here's the image of the spaghetti nebula and based on my field of view I couldn't I could only get maybe a quarter of it. And by adding um, just clicking on the horizontal panel and a vertical panel, I could pretty much size this up to fit the whole thing. And I actually would probably move this and get, um, yeah, one more row. And that would allow me to get everything, but I would need six different panels to do it. Um, this is with a 20% overlap, which I wouldn't go any smaller than that. I've tried doing mosaics before, and if you don't have at least the 20% overlap, you run the risk of, of having uh, empty space in between some of your images. The cool part about this is that you can um, add this as, or as a sequence target and it brings you here and it, it gives you all the panels and all the coordinates that you would need for each one of those panels. So it's all done for you. All you have to do is put in um, your actual sequence and then make sure that you center on target for each sequence and slew to target and then you could pretty much uh, set it and forget it and do all of these in one night or you could actually populate three, leave three empty and then the next night is say you wanted to do panels one, two, and three the first night and then you could move these over to do uh, you know four, five, and six the next night the third seldom used Nina function I want to cover is um, the sequence template. And you do that by building a sequence. So let's say um, I wanted to take 10 minute exposures and I was going to do 16 of them in uh, HSNO. So we'll 
put two more in here and then just change the filters. And now I plan on using this for quite some time, so I want to make a template out of it. So what you would do is, is you come down here and save sequence as a new XML file, and we would call this um, target, and then maybe I'd put the date, but for now I'll just say target2, we'll hit save, I'd probably put what it was if it was going to be over the course of a while. And then um, you go to options and sequence template and you could pick target two, click open. And now when you go back to sequence, uh, if you create a new sequence, it'll already be filled out for you, which will save you time. You can also go to um, your framing assistant and say add as a sequence target and you know, I had Andromeda in there, but it, I wouldn't do that in, in narrow band usually, but it, it, you get the idea. It'll load it from in here and it'll all be populated for you. Now, as far as I know, the new version of Nina that's coming out, it's going to replace the entire sequence. So depending on when you're watching this video and what version you have, this might not be helpful to you. But if you're using the current release version, um, this still works for now. I'm sure they'll have a tool very similar to this once the new one comes out as well. The fourth feature of Nina that I think is seldom used and I almost never see in anyone's videos is the aberration inspector. And this is fantastic for checking to see if your back focus is set correctly or if your polar alignment is on. Um, if you hover over this, you'll see the aberration inspector here on your image tab. And when you click on it, it'll bring up um, the uh, boxes from the corners of your image that you have on the screen. And from here, you could check to see if you've got any egg-shaped or football-shaped stars out on the edges. So it's just a quick way to look over it and say, yeah, look, I've got a you know an issue here, or maybe I you could see get a better understanding if you have any kind of uh, tilt in your imaging train or uh, if there's a pattern you could uh, troubleshoot back focus a lot easier. Overall this is a tool that I really don't use that often. I've used it once when I first um, set up my camera on my telescope uh, to make sure that I got back focus correct and then since then I haven't used. And I should use it more often especially if I'm going to do 15 or 20 minute sub exposures, even 10 minute sub exposures. If you open this from time to time while you're, once your exposures are completed, just to head off any incidences that you might have before you have a whole pile of 10, 15 minute sub exposures and notice that your stars are oddly shaped. So the fifth tool that I seldom use because I normally use Telescopius is using the Sky Atlas to find targets. And the reason that I'm adding this, because anybody could pretty much use Telescopius, it's a lot easier and uh, more visually appealing. However, if, like many people, you go out into the field, or you go out to a dark site, and you don't have internet connectivity, then this is fantastic to find um, an image if you haven't planned uh, what image that you're going to shoot or maybe you have and you've got clouds in that area and another part of the sky is wide open and you've driven all the way out to your dark site and you don't want to waste that time. So in here you would just put in uh, the minimum altitude from about 6 at night to 5 in the morning say and you would want to image say at 20 degrees and then you would just search and this should bring up a nice list of all of the objects that are in the night sky. And then from here, you can pick uh, an object that you like or a target, and then you can slew to it, set for the framing assistant, and, and get a sequence going on it. Another feature that I seldom see used uh, by anybody on YouTube is the image file path and the file pattern. I'm sure that a lot of people use this. Uh, it's just that this got me when I first started using Nina. I came over from APT and I didn't realize that this target name uh, needed to be populated. And I picked a few targets for the night and I started imaging. And what happened was is that because I didn't have this target name in here, the image type 
overwrote the last image set of images that I took from my previous target. So at the end of the night, the next day, I went to copy my images over to my uh, main processing computer and I noticed that my other targets weren't there. And I had to do a lot of research to figure out that you need to put the target name in here if you're going to do multiple targets in one night. Otherwise, um, Nina would overwrite that. And maybe in the newer versions, that's not the case anymore. But it's, it's better anyway because this will actually give you a whole folder with just those lights in it that you can um, copy over to your processing computer at a later time. So it makes it a lot easier to put this in anyway. And so in order to add to your image file pattern, all you do is you come down here and you double click and it'll actually append it to the end and then you can move it around. What I've done is I've added my gain, which wasn't in here before. And I take a lot of narrowband imaging and I use um, my unity gain for my camera, which is 139. And I also use um, a gain of 200 a lot of times. I use a gain of 200 when I can only take a five minute exposure because of a full moon or I don't want to really blow out some of the cores or stars of certain objects. I'll use a five minute exposure instead of a 10 minute exposure and I up the gain to 200. So I've got in my dark library um, a five minute and a 10 minute at a gain of 139 and a gain of 200. So this really helps when I'm looking to stack my images, I could pick the correct master darks for um, the lights that I'm using. So I got the idea for this video from uh, last week's video's comments. Uh, so I wanted to give a shout out to Richard Boyd who let me know that you're able to load a file into Nina to plate solve and get coordinates off of. Also, Jordan Cook left the link to a video that the developer from Nina actually was on and he was talking about a lot of the features of Nina and so I used some of those features in this video as well and I'm gonna leave a link to that video in the description below because he got into a lot more depth and detail it's a much longer video uh, but I, a lot of the ideas that he showed I used um, in this as well so as usual if you like this type of content please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe it really does help and we'll see you in the next video.